Well, I couldn't have picked a better song for you to sing. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Michelle. I want you to turn your Bibles today to Mark chapter 10. We're going through the Gospel of Mark. Under the uh, overall theme, the overarching theme, the Gospel in action. And I just, when I read through Mark, I see, and, and, I, and this is not original with me, it was my uh, Greek professor, Dr. Curtis Vaughn, at Southwestern Seminary pointed out, he said, look at these action verbs. They, and not, not only verbs, but just words that next, immediately, then, just you get this sense of a, of a hurried pace. Mark, Mark does not tell us, and remember we believe that Mark's gospel of the, of the memoirs of the Apostle Peter, he doesn't tell us about the, the birth narratives. Jesus bursts on the scene and it seems like Mark is trying to get him to the cross as quickly as he can to, to tell about the great grand display of the gospel. And we come here in chapter 10 having looked last week at this warning that, that we'd not be a stumbling block to anyone. We come in chapter 10 to Jesus' teaching on divorce, which is occasioned by the Pharisees coming to him to try to trap him. Mark chapter 10, verses 1 to 12 is what I want us to read today. If you've found that in your Bibles, or if you don't have a Bible, we'll have the text on the screen for you. But stand with me, if you would, and simply follow along as I read these 12 verses from the Gospel of Mark. And he left there and went to the region of Judea and beyond the Jordan, and crowds gathered to him. And again, as was his custom, he taught them. And Pharisees came up, and in order to test him, asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, What did Moses command you? And then he said, Moses, then they said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce and to send her away. And Jesus said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, he wrote you this commandment. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. And in the house, the disciples asked him again about this matter. And he said to them, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. This is what? It is the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient word of God. May the Lord help us today to understand the teachings of Jesus and the teachings of the apostles as they, as they drew upon his teaching and fleshing this out in our own lives and in the life of the church. Thank you. Please be seated. There is probably, it's interesting that Josh used the word I have in my notes here, there's probably not a stickier subject in the life of the church than the discussion of divorce. And the interesting thing is, is you can poll Christian pastors and get a number of different perspectives, each one asserting biblical basis and convictions concerning when divorce is biblically allowed and when remarriage is biblically allowed. The positions run the gamut from the pastor who will remarry anyone, anytime, for any reason or for no reason at all, to the pastor who will not remarry anyone and who believes that anyone who has been divorced and remarried is disqualified from positions of leadership in the church. I want to say at the outset that I am not in either of those extreme camps. I have, however, tried through the years to follow what I understand to be the Bible's teachings on the subject of marriage, divorce, and remarriage, the implications of these. So what I want to try to do today in just a few minutes is take this passage and some other passages, some supplemental passages. We're going to think through this on six 
perspectives. First of all, we see the Pharisees testing Jesus on the issue of divorce. We see Jesus responding by testing the Pharisees on the law. And then next, Jesus teaches the Pharisees on God's design for marriage. And fourth, Jesus teaches the disciples on the seriousness of divorce. Then I want to ask a question. What are the biblical grounds for divorce? And finally, is unbiblical divorce the unpardonable sin? Let's look at these things. The text tells us that he, he left there and went to the region of Judea beyond Jordan and crowds gathered. And again, as it was his custom, he taught them. And we would love to know what he taught them. We would love to know what was being taught there. But again, Mark's in a hurry. So he moves us to this next episode. Pharisees came up in order to test him. Now, their only, their only reason for traveling, it's remarkable. It, isn't it interesting? The energy that was spent by the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Sanhedrin to try to trick Jesus, to try to expose Jesus, to try to denigrate Jesus. If you could have harnessed that energy... For the glory of God, for the kingdom of God, how, how amazing that would have been. But they're, they're, they're energetic. They're, they're, they're zealous to do this. They, they came to test him. And they asked him, point out, we don't know why this was triggered. We, we don't know if somebody in their little circle decided, we can get him on this. Let's, let's press him on this issue. Uh, he won't have an answer that will be satisfactory on this. Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Now, that's, they set the stage. That's the question, really, isn't it? Can a husband ever lawfully divorce his wife? And, and implied in this, though these fellows were in a culture that was very male-dominated and women didn't have a lot of say, Jesus came on the scene to change that, but, but that's not their mindset. They, they wouldn't even think to ask, is it lawful for a wife to divorce her husband? That wasn't even in, in the thinking It's, it's interesting to me that the more you read about the Pharisees, how similar they were in many ways to, to Muslims. They treated women like second-class citizens. They were, they were not their equal. So here's the question. Well, Jesus answered as he often does with a question. He tests them. He says in verse 3, what did Moses command you? It's fascinating now. Because if you go back and read the Old Testament on this, Moses didn't command anyone to divorce anybody. Their answer should have been Moses didn't issue a command on this. What they say is Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce and to send her away. In the Old Testament law, when you go back and read that, this did occur. And it was really interesting. That you could send a woman away for pretty much any reason if she displeased you. If the meal wasn't up to par, etc., etc. Jesus said to them, because of your hardness of heart, he wrote you this commandment. What's he talking about there? He's saying because sin factors into the human condition divorce became a reality. But he goes on and he teaches them about the design for marriage. And, and let me say this. Anyone contemplating marriage, anyone entering into marriage ought to enter into it with this in mind, it breaks my heart that 40 plus years of premarital counseling and preparing people for marriage, a young man, a young woman, to see them enter into that. With all this out before them. And yet some of these marriages end in divorce. Jesus says, from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. It's interesting he says that. He, he says, what's he telling us there? 
He says, look guys, men and women are different. If you're entering marriage looking for sameness, you can be disappointed at the outset. Women do not think like men. Men do not think and process like women. They're, they're different. We're different. Expect when you get married, and if you've been married any time at all here, then I'm telling you something you already know. Expect differences. Expect occasions when the rub is going to be pretty intense. Expect a time when it may even cross your mind, I don't need this. I would be better off not married than married. Sin does that to us. From the beginning, God made them male and female, Jesus says. Therefore, and then he, then he, then he cites the, the, the Genesis understanding of what happens. And I, want you to, I want you to remember when this was said in, in Genesis chapter 2. The idea of, of fatherhood and motherhood was not existent. There was Adam and Eve. If they looked for a parent, they would trace the parent parentage back to their creator God. They're, they didn't have anybody to call mom and anyone to call dad, but listen to the principle laid down before there was the reality. He says, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. There comes a time when a man now takes the, does the manly thing, takes the manly step that he leaves mom and dad, and he takes into himself a helper suitable to his need, and he clings to her. He cherishes her. He care, not smothering her, but caring for her, loving her, taking her as, him, as himself. Ephesians says that, that no man mistreats his own body. He is to, and his wife is to be considered as a part of his body. He's, she was taken from his body. The woman Ish was, Isha was taken from Ish and The principles are clear. The conclusion is what therefore God has joined together. Let no man separate. The word separate here is the word amputate. It carries forth that idea of two becoming one flesh when you're married, when you're joined together in, in, in holy matrimony in the sight of God, in the name of God, pledging as two believers that you will give yourself to one another as you give yourself to God. And you've seen the triangle if you've done any marriage counseling or marriage training at all, marriage conferences at all, the triangle where there's you here and there's the, there's the spouse here and there's God here. And the closer you move to God, the closer you draw to God, the closer you come to one another in that arrangement. What God has joined together, let no one be a party to the amputation that is divorce. Divorce can happen. And it does happen. But it's not a simple changing of address. It's an amputation. People heal from amputations. But it's an amputation nonetheless. And, and he is teaching us, Jesus is teaching us here that, that marriage is very sacred and marriage is very solemn. And it grieves me that on the scene today, the millennials have watched or grown up in so much marital tragedy that they choose not to be married. They'll just cohabitate, they call it. They'll just live together. We'll take all the benefits of marriage without the responsibility, and that way we won't, we'll, we'll avoid the heartache of divorce, but it's not true. When you live together, and you, you join yourselves together as one flesh, and there, if the breakup comes down the road, it is an amputation, no matter what you call it. If it, ever, if it never had marriage attached to it, and you never use the word divorce, the, the reality is the same. God made us, God made man for relationship with woman. It is not good that the man will be, should be alone. 
You know, it's interesting, God did not first say in, in the Genesis account, the man needs someone with whom he can propagate the earth. No, that was not... The, it is not good that the man should be alone. It was about relationship. It was about fulfillment. And he made woman for man. And man to be for woman. And we ought to hold a high standard about this topic of marriage. And I want you to know as your pastor that I do. In the, there's been times in the past when I have done marital pre-counseling and said to the couple in the middle of it or toward the end of it, I can't do this. I cannot be a party to joining the two of you in marriage. Oh, it, oh, it makes people so mad. I've seen couples in the past and families leave the church because I would not perform the wedding as if, as if there's some sort of obligation on my part because I wear the mantle of pastor that I have to marry and bury everybody that comes along. I, that's not true. I take it very personally, very seriously, very biblically that as best as I can, being a fallible human being, that, that when I'm joining someone in marriage, participating in that, I'm doing that under God, in the sight of God, with the blessing of God. And by the way, the, the greater tragedy for me is when I've done that and they go on to get divorced. It's, it, that's hit very close to home in our family. And it pains me deeply. Marriage is serious and honorable. And Jesus presses this when he gets along with the disciples. If you look at verses 10 to 12 here. In the house, the disciples ask him about this. That, Tell us more, Master. There's something you didn't say there. He, he looked right at them. And he said, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And it's interesting, what Jesus, Jesus went farther than the Pharisees were willing to go because he, he thinks about the wife. And if she divorces her husband. See, what in, in the Pharisees' mind, it wasn't even an option for a woman to divorce a man. This was a man's call. It's a man's world. A woman just had to deal with it. Notice how Jesus elevates women, even when he's teaching on difficult things. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. And you stop there, and you get all kinds of applications from this. I've counseled people in the past who were told by their pastor, by some significant religious influence in their lives, that they would live their lives, their entire lives as an adulterer, as an adulteress if they dared remarry, that because they had married poorly one time, because, because they had found themselves in a situation where they divorced their spouse, that they were left for the rest of their lives to suffer in singleness, whether called to it or not, because they had made that bad choice, that unwise commitment. Let's just look real briefly. I want to open this up for you. What are the biblical grounds for divorce? Jesus teaches on this in another place in, in Matthew 19. And I, I want you to hear this because see if all we know is Mark 10, then we come down. Now let me say something to you. The, the guys in the two extreme positions who don't consider, you know, they're marrying Sam's. They'll marry anybody. I've, I've talked to so many couples through the years, and I said, well, tell me about the, the premarital counseling you went through with your pastor before you were married. Well, we didn't do any of that. I'm thinking, that is criminal. And I'm here to tell you, if you were, if you were married by a man, I don't care how much you loved him, careful, who did not take the time to sit down with the two of you and walk you through some, some biblical principles, some anticipation issues before he married you, he sinned against you. It is criminal to be a marrying Sam who just, who just gets all giddy. Oh, you want me to marry you? My goodness, I'm just so thrilled. To... 
But it's, it's simple. It's clean. You never have to think through anything. never have to reason biblically. You just, you just do it. Now, you may think me unkind. I'm going to tell you about that. Years ago, many decades ago, I got a phone call from a fella. It was on like Wednesday or Thursday. I was the associate, it was, so you know where I was serving at the time. I told you about that. The senior pastor was out. This fellow on the other side, I was serving in Louisiana, though I'm a native of Texas. He said, oh, well, yeah, uh, me and the missus thought we'd let you do the honor of marrying us this weekend. I said, really? He said, yeah. Getting married Saturday. I said, well, I appreciate you calling me. I said, There's, I, I, got a, I got some challenges here, though. I said, I normally require at least six premarital counseling sessions before I will agree to marry anyone. Well, that won't be necessary, he said, because we've both been married before. I said, so... You divorced or did your spouse die? Well, I'm divorced. Your fiance divorced or did her spouse die? No, she divorced too. I said, well then, my observation is that you desperately need premarital counseling since you each have a failed marriage in your past. Well, he got a little huffy with me at that point. He didn't appreciate where the conversation was going. I mean, after all, I was trampling all over this privilege he was going to allow me. And he got, as he got huffy, I did something, and I regretted it when I did it, I'll be honest with you. I said, well, is she there with you now? Yeah. I said, is there another phone in the house? Yeah. I said, tell her to get on it. I'll go ahead and marry you right now. What? I said, but it doesn't mean any more to you than that. I'll go get on the phone. I'll marry both of you right now. Which I wouldn't have done, you understand. It was a, it was an over, it was a sarcastic overemphasis to make a point. And of course he missed the point. And, uh, and railed at me and called me some things I won't repeat here in, in mixed company. But uh, he said, well, I'll find somebody else to marry. So I said, I don't have a doubt in the world that's true that you'll find somebody to marry. That's not, not, not the question of my mind. You see, I've said to young couples in the past, I cannot go through this with you in terms of the, the ceremony, the wedding ceremony, but I promise you this, with God as my witness. On the other side of it, once you've found somebody to marry you, and you will find somebody to marry you, I will be in your corner the strongest advocate for the success of your marriage you've ever found. I, because I'm for marriage. What are the biblical grounds? Well, if you read Jesus in Matthew 19, verses 8 and 9, he said to them, because of your hardness of heart, it's a similar experience here. Moses allowed you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, and marries another, commits adultery. So now we have a little expanded window into Jesus' thinking. In Jesus' mind, there are what you would call uh, grounds or a basis for divorce. Now, let me say this. I've counseled couples through the years who've, who've faced marital infidelity, and that is not a get-out-of-jail-free card necessarily. You say, well, phew, now I can divorce this no count because he or she committed adultery. It is a grounds for that. The, the, the powerful, more powerful picture is to, is to take the, to read through the, the lenses of Hosea the prophet who married a prostitute, who, who went off from him and had a child, not by him, had a child by another man, named the child Loami. In other words, not my child was Hosea's re response to this child. And God said, go, go get her. She's on, the, she's on the chopping block, the market, the slave. She's about to be sold. Take what you have and go buy her back. That's the more powerful, beautiful gospel picture that you would even take back a spouse who had been unfaithful. I've walked some people through that in the past. It's been beautiful to see.
But it is a grounds, a biblical grounds for divorce. Now, so now then what you start thinking is, well, then Jesus' statement in Mark's Gospel chapter 10 is not a categorical end of discussion. Because see, the guys on the other end who say, no divorce, and if you ever divorce, then, then we're going to hang a big red D around your neck. And you can't help with the babies in the nursery and you can't teach a Sunday school class and you can't serve and you can't do this, that, and the other because you are, you are tarnished goods and the world needs to know that you have the big red D around your neck. You see, for those guys, it's a nice, clean thing too. It's easy. Just I knew a pastor when I was in seminary like that. He pastored one of the larger churches in the Fort Worth area and it was just cut and dried. No, no remarriage. Period. But see, Jesus gives an exception in Matthew's gospel. Marital infidelity is a biblical grounds for divorce. Pornaya is the word. We get our word pornography from it. When the spouse has committed adultery against you, you can be divorced and are free to remarry. The second ground comes up in Paul's writing. We read it in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, where he admonishes a believer. And think about the circumstances here. If you were in Corinth and you were married before you met Paul, in all likelihood you were married as unbelievers, as pagans. Probably went through some pagan ritual to be married. And then Paul, the apostle, comes to town, preaches the gospel, and you as the wife or you as the husband hear the gospel, and you are saved by the gospel, and now you are, you are different. Your, your worldview becomes very different from your spouse. But your spouse agrees to stay with you even though you are now a believer. And he says the, the right thing to do is to, stay, to not divorce. It's interesting, isn't it? Don't divorce the unbeliever. Don't, don't use wrong logic and say, well, now that I'm a Christian and you're, you're an unbeliever, we're incompatible. I, I'm not supposed to marry an unbeliever. <laughs> well, you, but you were an unbeliever when you married the unbeliever, see? He says, no, stay with them. But if they leave, if the spouse, the unbelieving spouse, abandons you, then you're not enslaved. You're, you're not bound. You're free again, to remarry. A second, what we call biblical ground for divorce. When an unbelieving spouse leaves a believing spouse. Now it gets, you have to, you have to nuance this, and just because a person claims to be a believer, if they're acting like a hellion and an unbeliever, then they're an unbelieving spouse, no matter if they can produce a baptism certificate or not. So there's a desertion by a believing spouse, a believing spouse by an unbelieving spouse. You see, in the Old Testament, this was handled by stoning one of the people to death, usually the woman. So, so you, you always, your marriage always ended in death. No matter whether the spouse died of natural causes or died of judicial punishment. But in the New Testament, stoning is not, is not an option. Jesus Christ has come to show us a more excellent way. And it's, it's, this is why Paul speaks the way he does. Pagan cultures, they would not look to Jewish law to settle the matter. I want to introduce a third ground, though. And I think it is the Sixth Commandment, which says in Exodus 20, verse 13, you shall not kill. Now, if, you're, if you understand catechisms, and I will encourage you, you need to be catechizing your children. If you're not, talk to me about how to do that. We'll get you the tools. We'll get you the... the Westminster Shorter Catechism, question 68, asks... After asking in the previous question, what is the Sixth Commandment, ask, what is required in the Sixth Commandment? And the answer is, the Sixth Commandment requires all lawful endeavors to preserve our own life and the life of others. Now, I went through this years ago when I preached through the Ten Commandments here. 
But very quickly, the reason self-defense is biblical is the positive teaching of the Sixth Commandment when it says you shall not kill is teaching that you shall do everything you can to protect your own life and the life of others. I taught you this then, that when someone comes into my home to do me harm, they're trying to take bread out of the mouths of those that I care for, and I will defend myself with deadly force and not be guilty of the Sixth Commandment because all I'm doing is protecting my own life and the life of others. When that is applied to the issue of marriage, no woman is called by God to stay in a relationship where she is being brutalized by her husband. A marriage certificate does not give a man, and in some cases give a woman, a title to, to abuse the other person and that person have no way out. It would be a violation of the Sixth Commandment for someone to stay in such a relationship. Now to me it's just the practical working out of Christianity. An evangelical look at the law. It's not trying to find excuses. But I've counseled people in the past and I've said to them, God hasn't called you to suffer in this relationship nor to see your children suffer. For you to stay, if it's dangerous, is to sin against yourself and to sin against your children. And it's a sin against God and His commandments. Proverbs 24, 11, 12 says, Rescue those who are being taken away to death. Hold back those who are stumbling to the slaughter. If you say, Behold, we did not know this, does not he who weighs the heart perceive it? Does not he who keeps watch over your soul know it? Will he not repay man according to his work? We're responsible, folks. That's why the church should be on the front lines of the abortion issue. We cannot plead ignorance. And we'll be held accountable by God for how we handle being pro-life. In the same way, we'd be held accountable as a church by God if we would allow abusive relationships to go on within our church. If we don't step in to defend the victim, then we're sinning against God. So, so those to me, it seems, are what we call biblical grounds for divorce. Marital infidelity, the desertion of a believing spouse by an unbelieving spouse, and the Sixth Commandment, when the, when the life of the spouse and or children are at risk in the relationship. The last thing I want to ask today then is this, is unbiblical divorce the unpardonable sin because that's how it's treated sadly. It's interesting to me that in the church of Jesus Christ that a person can be a murderer, come out of prison, repent of being a murderer, be received into the fellowship of the church and watch to grow, grow in grace. Can have been an embezzler, come out of prison, can have been a, a drunk involved in, involved in a drunken wreck. You can go down the list of sins that the church is all too willing to forgive. When it comes to divorce for some reason, I think it's a misreading of the scripture really. We set the gospel aside and we pick up our pharisaical robes. Say now for you it's different. And it's tragic when I counsel people who really believe that somehow because they got divorced and remarried that they are living as adulterers, there, there's no pardon for them, no forgiveness for them. Let me tell you something, folks. The gospel of Jesus Christ is bigger than that. And I think the key that you go back to is when Jesus said to those Pharisees, it is because of the hardness of your heart. It is because of the reality, the presence of sin, that divorce ever became a reality. And we deal with that sin today. It's interesting, I was reading... Uh, Tim Keller. He said, divorce is sometimes necessary and some people are awfully self-righteous about divorce and look down their nose at any divorced person. But Jeremiah, in Jeremiah 3, 8, God says, I divorced Israel. He uses the term for his relationship to Israel. I divorced Israel. So Keller says, God has the audacity to call himself a divorced person. If you don't want to have anything to do with a divorced person, you're in the unenviable position of not having anything to do with God because God is not afraid to call himself a divorced person. Then he says this, and this is, this is, this, I found this so refreshing because of my own 
convictions. People ask me constantly, what about a divorce that doesn't live up to the specs? What about a divorce? What, what, if, I, what if I was the guilty party? And that I was the one knee deep in sin? What if I just walked away and never had biblical grounds for divorce? What happens to me? Keller says this. I'll tell you the quick answer, but it's not an easy answer. The quick answer is an unbiblical divorce cannot be the unforgivable sin. To ask the question, can a sinfully divorced person be remarried, is to ask the same question, can murderers and swindlers and perjurers who have repented, can they be married or remarried? The answer is yes. Why should this other be different? He says, of course, I believe that repentance is something that cleanses the slate. You see, it's not going soft on sin to call for repentance. And in the course of my ministry, I've had the occasion to sit down with people previously married, previously married, wanting to marry one another, and I've walked them through this very thing. And the person who would look at me and say, I did nothing wrong in my previous marriage. I'll say to them, you know something? I love you, but I can't participate in this. When the person looks at me, as they often do, with tears, saying, you know, my, my spouse sinned against me, but you know something? I sinned against my spouse. That repentance is taken by God as genuine. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And repentance is a cleansing act. And we need to preach a gospel that God forgives sinners all kinds of sinners. Not simply, not just sinners who sin in every way except in the arena of marriage. Uphold marriage, you better believe it. Stand strong for it, you better believe it. I've done it for 40 years. I've practiced it for almost 42 because I have a patient wife. But to somehow Set that apart from the entire catalog of sins where the Scripture says our God is willing to forgive when we repent. It's to be pharisaical. It's not a proper response to the Mary and Sam. The proper response is to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to every situation. And where you face a situation where there is no repentance then you act accordingly. You do not participate in unrepentance. But when you encounter a situation where there is repentance, then you assure on gospel terms forgiveness by God and forgiveness by fellow believers. And it's time that we as the church stop cutting out our red A's and our red D's and hanging them around people's necks as if they're some sort of leper. And recognize that we are sinners. I thank God that gluttony is a forgivable sin. I thank God that lust is a forgivable sin. I thank God that anger is a forgivable sin. I thank God that failure to love like we ought to love is a forgivable sin if we repent of these things. Brothers and sisters, the key issue is when you take the teaching of Jesus in its whole, the teaching of the apostles, the implication of the commandments, that we hold high the banner of marriage and say to anyone entering it, you better enter it for a lifetime. And say to anyone in it who is thinking about walking away from it, you need to seriously reconsider and fight the fight of faith to stay in this and say to those who have not 
to those who have left their marriages, to those who have divorced, to those who find a helper and they want to remarry. We need to say to them, if there is repentance, there is forgiveness. That to me is the biblical approach to this matter. And it won't satisfy everybody because here's what I've found. People who've only been married to one spouse tend to be judgmental to those who haven't. And yet the scripture says we're to be charitable. And it's interesting to me, and I've watched it through the years, that the church is more willing to be kind and charitable to an outsider who walks in among them with a horrible background than we are with our own who themselves sinned, had failed marriages. And the difference to me, it seems, is we know about one, we don't know about the other, and that's not a basis by which we relate to people. We relate to them by the gospel of Jesus Christ. A gospel so powerful that a dying Savior could look at a thief hanging next to him and say, Today, you will be with me in paradise. That's the gospel we preach. It snatches thieves off a cross and takes them to heaven. And so let's be clear. Marriage is sacred. Divorce is sinful. But the unpardonable sin is to blaspheme the Holy Spirit. To live a life mocking the things of God or attributing the work of God to the work of the devil. To go into your grave with that disposition is the unpardonable sin. Not divorce. Let's pray.